I mean, you can hear me at the back, right? Yeah, OK. okay yeah, fantastic. OK, thanks, Dave. So yes, I, I was the CFO of the World Gold Council. Um, and actually, the idea for Hello Gold started about f five years ago, when I was still working for the World Gold Council. And the reason for that was, uh, as, part of my man as part of my portfolio as a CFO, I also, I also ran the world's largest gold fund, a $30 billion fund out of New York. And I then I also helped ICBC, the bank in China, launch a very simple bricks and mortar version of what we were doing in New York for the rich, but for the poor. Um, they basically allowed people to save in gold at spot for one RMB a time. You went to the bank, you put in one RMB, and you saved. And they saved it over time. And it grew basically from nothing to 11 million customers and $6 billion of gold being bought and sold every year. And it and now has 50% market share in China. It's so successful that Tencent, uh, we pay, have now collab is now collaborating with ICBC to launch it at a micro gold level. Um, and it's even more successful that I heard on Monday from my former boss that the Chinese government has told them to slow it down. So that's the power of gold. And if you can get it right, how fast this can grow. So I don't know how many of you know uh, much about gold. I'll give you some facts. There is around $5 trillion, $6 trillion of gold above ground today, of which only $1 trillion is held by central banks, which leaves about $5 trillion held either in the form of jewelry or investment. Our estimates is that there's some two and a half to three and a half trillion dollars of gold sitting in people's uh, what, safes, houses, vaults, for the purposes of saving for a better future. Now, just to give you a sense of what that looks like, if Hull of Gold or one of the other gold companies out there were to manage all that gold, we would be at two and a half trillion, the fifth largest asset management company in the world. If it was three and a half trillion, we'd be second only to BlackRock. So the, the potential of this market is huge. It's not just huge in terms of the people that hold gold. The people that hold cash, and the reason why a lot of you guys hold crypto is because cash doesn't do it for you. But actually, for the underserved, they have no choice. They don't have access to crypto wallets. They only have access, at best, to banks. And in ASEAN and China alone, 800 million people save cash every year. And they save $400 billion every year in cash. They don't have access to fixed deposits. They don't have access to mutual funds. They don't even, and therefore, they don't even have access to costless wallets to, to basically uh, save in something else. And of these 800 million people that we're talking about, just in ASEAN and China alone, 500 million of those don't have access to affordable financing, affordable financing that you guys have in terms of going to the bank and getting personal credit. They then have to resort to either uh, loan sharks, friends and family, you know, uh, beg, borrow, steal from their, from their employers to enable them to, to pay for whatever, they, whatever it is that they need. So the market, not just for the people that hold gold, but also the people that hold cash, is huge. So what we're trying to do with Hull Gold is essentially solve three fundamental problems that this underserved, unbanked market uh, faces. One is the inability to save better, because when you hold, hold money in cash, you don't earn interest. And also, for these people in the emerging markets, they're exposed to volatile currencies. We will solve that because gold, typically in the long run, uh, increases at the rate of local inflation. And we've seen that in time immemorial. I mean, gold has the longest track record in financial <coughs> history. We will also enable people to basically use that gold as a form of collateral. Now, typically, in today's, in today's market, when you, take, uh, when you do pawnbroking, in Malaysia, as, a, as an example, you will pay between 15 to 15% per annum. Through the Hull Gold product, we're going to enable people to borrow using their gold at 8 to 9%. We're going to give them more affordable financing because we can. And the last but not least, what we want to do is enable people to remit. So if your maid in, in Singapore wants to send money back to Indonesia, typically you know, they'll go to downtown and go through the local money changer, money transfer agent, or they can go through Western Union, and it costs a lot of money. What we want to do is enable them to transfer their gold to their friends and family at home at no cost. It will be a free service for them. 
what we want to do is enable, the, enable people to give money to where they want, want it, uh, where it's needed um, at the lowest possible price. So that is what, that is what Halagod is all about. Now, we're live in Malaysia. We've been live actually since about April 2. Uh, we launched officially in April, and, and uh, we now have 2,500 customers that have been onboarded and KYC with us, saving about 100 US dollars of gold uh, with us at this point in time. And also, we've actually closed our Series A. So we've raised just over 2.5 million US dollars, uh, and we're going to use that to, to fund our expansion. And we're looking to expand in the next 12 months into Thailand and China, and then subsequently into Indonesia and Philippines before we head west to India and the Middle East. So, you know, we've talked about Hollow Gold and, and what it does, but actually what's more important is our, our vision. Basically, our, our issue is that we don't believe that the size, the amount of cash that someone holds in their wallet should be a barrier to their ability to access the same financial products that the rich have or that, that, that people have in developed countries such as Singapore. We basically want to remove affordability and accessibility from the equation. We want to basically democratize and digitize gold products for them to save and borrow better. That's our vision. That's our idea of financial inclusion. And we, we do this by basically making all our products one unit of the local currency. So in Malaysia, it's one ringgit. In Thailand, we want Thai baht. And in Indonesia, we want Indonesian root. So what's in it? Why are we doing to, uh, token sale? We've raised money. You know, uh, we've got enough runway for the next 12 to 18 months. So why are we doing a token sale? Well, one of the challenges, one of the inherent disadvantages of doing the traditional route and, doing, and going to market the way we're going is that um, you can't go global, right? With, with a token sale, with the introduction of a gold back token, so you don't even have to be KYC'd as, as a Hello Gold customer. Anyone can, get a, can, can buy a gold back token, and then we can proliferate across countries. So we plan to complement our on-the-ground strategy which is basically to have boots on the ground, sign up local partners that the local community trusts um, with a gold back token. And this will then enable also folks in, say, in, in, in Malaysia that are really Hello Gold customers, if they want to transfer wealth to a, a person in Guatemala where we don't have operations, they can just convert their gold into gold back tokens seamlessly and at no cost. So, Specifically for Hello Gold, we want to implement our blockchain. We do actually have a blockchain angle to what we do. Our blockchain angle, apart from the token, is that we're housing all our customer data and our key transaction records on the blockchain because we believe that that's the best way to manage risk for us to protect our client assets. We have huge ambitions to expand our, our reach and our, uh, in terms of products and our technical, technical capability to enable financial inclusion in markets beyond where we, where we are. For example, what we want to do is basically enable uh, folks in refugee camps in the Middle East to create uh, financial infrastructure. As you can imagine, in, in refugee camps or in, in areas where there's war, no one's going to put financial infrastructure in. There are no ATM machines. There are going to be very little visa, visa terminals. We want to basically enable people to use their mobile phone to save in a currency other than the local one, because in, in these countries, typically, currencies are incredibly volatile. And so they want to save, save themselves from inflation. And also tra to transact. They can still transact in local currency, but will just be converted in the form of gold back tokens, which for them, they understand. I mean, for a lot of these uh, mass market consumers, they don't understand Bitcoin. They don't understand Ether, but they understand gold. And it also obviously offers our customers an easy entry in the crypto space. They get gold. The gold back token is just a tokenized version of gold. It gives them the, uh, the, the nursery steps into the token world be before they expand into other cryptocurrencies. For our supporters, we are going to give uh, 3.8 million 
uh, Golvac tokens to all our supporters. And, we're, uh, and that's about a nine to 10 time return on the initial price that, that, we're, that we're going to be selling our tokens for over time. And um, for the crypto community, you know, what we're doing with the introduction of the blockchain to the mass market is that hopefully they'll prove a use case at, for a larger base of non-crypto users than typically what we see in, in, the, in, in most crypto ventures at this point. And also, you know, as, as, as Ruin says, you know, you know, all the cryptocurrencies are, have some inherent volatility. And right now, if, if you know, there is a downturn in the market, typically all the currencies fall. And people, well, people tend to cash out to cash if they, if they need to cash out. What we want to do alongside a lot of the other gold-backed token uh, ventures is to offer people an alternative to cashing out to fiat. And I've talked about the mass market. So I'll, I'll come to the token sale now. Just in terms of structuring, uh, before I, I get into this, uh, as you know, the previous two speakers said, uh, no one tokens, no, to no two token sales are exactly identical. We've come up with a different structure based on our legal advice. Um, I think one of the things that I've learned is get your legal advisors on board really, really quickly um, because you want to make sure that you're on the right side of regulation. Um, I've also debated with a number of folks how you, th how you think about choosing your legal advisors. You can either choose someone that has done five ICOs and they'll have a good sense of what an ICO structure could look like. Uh, or you can go our way, which I deliberately chose a firm and a team that had never done an ICO before, primarily because I wanted them to create a token from first principles. So I got a team that, <clears throat> that was uh, experts in the securities market in, Singapore, in, uh, in the Singapore jurisdiction, because I wanted to make sure that whatever it is that we did fell within the, the, the right side of Singapore regulation. And I wanted to make sure that they had the experience of what would be deemed a security or a collective investment scheme. So that's what we did. I'm sure there are different ways of doing it, but that's how we did it. Um, so our structure is quite, kind of different. We have, we're setting up a foundation. The foundation effectively becomes a vehicle for the token supporters to put their tokens in. The, the foundation then give grant, gives grants uh, to the business, Hello Gold, uh, and the grants as with all grants, have uh, deliverables and performance ma uh, management clauses that requires the business to report back. And you know, if they breach the terms of the grant, they stop giving the grant. Hello Gold, the business in turn, will then create an endowment back to the foundation. Uh, and just like all endowments, there'll be terms and conditions that you know, the funds will be used for certain things. So there are two different contracts that are not uh, linked at all. And then the foundation, at its discretion, will reward token holders with gold-back tokens uh, as it sees fit. So that's basically our structure. Now, coming to the token sale itself, again, we have structured it kind of differently from everyone else. Um, we decided that instead of, of raising the full amount in one go, we're only going to raise a third, so we're raising about eight million dollars, and we plan to. Uh, we, we've laid out the deliverables for that eight million dollars over the first year. Assuming that we achieve those, that our deliverables will then go back to market and publish what we've done, and the market will decide whether they're going to reward us by buying another eight million dollars worth of tokens for the next set of, set of deliverables, or they'll punish us by not taking up the tokens. So in that sense, uh, we're letting market forces dictate um, whether we're going to be successful in releasing our second and third tranches of tokens in the second and third year. So I think, you know, as Ruin said, there are different ways of doing it. I do think that what's important is that uh, you know, if you think about ICO, you've got to think about how much you really need and how much can you really spend uh, prudently for your business. And, and, and then decide what kind of mechanics or governance structure uh, you have to put in place to keep you honest and to keep your token supporters happy with what you do. 
Okay, so I think uh, I'll tell you the things that we didn't do that we should have done now that we know. Well, we, we, um, <coughs> I, I, I had the, we had the opportunity of, of doing this much, much earlier. Uh, we kept it very late, and you know, um, so we didn't listen to our advisor either. So I think you should listen to your advisor, or at least have a really good reason not to listen to your advisor. But I think one of the challenges of running a, a startup, which all you know, ICOs basically fund, um, you have day jobs to run. I think the, one of the problems with us is that we got so caught up in getting our business up and running that we didn't really focus on the ICO until about two months ago. And then we started thinking about it, and, and, and it became uh, a bit late, but we're running hard to catch up. So I think listening to your advisors is very, very important. Um, the other thing, I think, is that you need to think about how you want to distribute uh, the, the number of supporters you want. I mean, there are two, two ways that you can think about it. Uh, you can either do big whale pre-sales and basically you know, get it all sold so that you can uh, go back to your day job. But the challenge with that is that potentially if you, if you get the whales in, you know, because they're looking for the big jump uh, after the ICO, they all dump, and then you have a big problem with your ICO price, and the uh, little guys all suffer because they came in with the big bonuses. So, uh, but if you do the little guys, then you have to spend a lot of time marketing, and, and you get dis distracted from your day job. So what we've done is we've done a split. We've kind of hedged our bets. We're going to have a, a relatively... Uh, large pre-sale, but we're committing to maintaining at least uh, a, a, a minimum, a minimum size of I think 10 ETH or something like that. What or a kind of five ETH ether for 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 the pre-sale, so you can actually come in. Sorry, there's a min maximum size of thirty thousand dollars in in the uh, in the ICO itself, so that everyone can come in. Great, thank you.